Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining Flex Train, a flexible training opportunity brought to you by John Stone Supply. So this week, we're um, we're still talking about universal parts as they're related to what we keep in stock and, you know, what are good um, GP options for your service vans and, and your service departments. So when we talk about capacitors and more particularly, we start talking about universal capacitors. Um, I, I want to go back to one of the classes that we had this last summer when we were talking about the breakdown of capacitors and the history of capacitors, because it's it's hard to understand exactly what component we are replacing unless we understand how that component is constructed and what its entire purpose is. You know, it, it's easy for a technician to, to go out and find a part and go, oh, this part's bad, so let's go ahead and replace this part. Well, we really have to focus on what part are we replacing and what is the new part that we're going to be installing. So if we talk about capacitors in general, we just need to understand what a capacitor is. So by definition, a capacitor is an electrical component that stores electrical energy in an electric field. The effect of a capacitor is known as its capacitance. Uh, capacitors were originally known as uh, condensers or condensators. If we work on any early automotive ignition systems, we're, we're aware of condensers when they were you know, on a points ignition system, but it was just, um, it was just a capacitor. And they are still known in many countries as condensers and condensators. So the earliest forms of capacitors were created in the, um, the 1740s when a European experimenters discovered that electrical charge could be stored in water-filled jars that came to be known as Leyden jars. So they were able to collect static electricity and they needed a means of storing it. So what they did uh, when they were experimenting you know, with the materials that they had to construct in that time frame, you know, it was very, um, very simple components. So we used a glass jar, we used um, a metal rod, which was typically brass, and we used some type of a insulator, which ended up just pretty much being cork. And so they took a, um, a metal coating, so they would, they would form a metal coating on the outside of that glass, which is an, an insulating barrier. And then they would put an internal metal coating, and then they would fill that with water. Sometimes it was, um, say, you know, salt water. Sometimes it was regular water. And, you know, they just experimented with different salinities of um, uh, of, of conductive fluids. And so they would build uh, static electricity and then they would store static electricity inside of that Leyden jar, which then they were able to discharge it and you know use it for um, experimental purposes. So if we look at the differences between capacitors and batteries, you know, we're using a sim similar principle. We're, we're taking electrons, so we're, we're, we're interrupting a magnetic field or a static field, and we're moving electrons from one, um, one source into another. Now we're going to store those electrons, and depending on how we discharge those electrons will depend on the construction of our holding um, facility, which it's either going to be a, a battery or a capacitor. So with a battery, we're going to um, store electrons and we're going to control the discharge. We're going to control the flow of those electrons um, so that we can maintain a constant velocity. We're going to maintain our constant voltage or pressure, and then we're going to discharge slowly. And with a capacitor, we're going to allow those electrons to collect and we're going to be able to just discharge those relatively quickly. So that being said, let me move on again here. Got my phone's blown up this morning as well. This that's what original Leyden jar looked like. Um, so this was a you know a, a late 17, early 1800s Leyden jar. We just collect static electricity, um, store it in our jar, and then have a means of discharging it. So the uh, the conductive plates of capacitors are they're generally made up of a metal foil or a metal film, allowing for the flow of electrons and discharge. But the uh, dielectric material used is um, it's an insulator. So the various insulating materials used in dielectric in a capacitor differ in their ability on how they block or how they pass an electrical discharge through it. So we have a variety of different fluids that are being used in capacitors. If we look at you know what a capacitor looks like on a wiring diagram, I'm sure everyone here has you know seen a wiring diagram of a capacitor. In, you know in the case of permanent um, split capacitor motors, we're using it to differentiate between the run winding and the start winding and do some assisting on those windings. Because if we look at what's happening inside of that permanent split capacitor motor, we know that we've got two windings. Uh, one of them that at, um, at low speeds has a high amount of capable torque and one that has a low amount of capable torque, which is a run winding, but we rely primarily on that run winding. So we use that capacitor 
to assist the starting torque of our permanent split capacitor motor, but then we allow that capacitor to be maintained in that circuit so that we're using some of the assistance of the torque of that start winding to maintain the operating um, horsepower or torque of that motor once it gets up to higher RPMs. But as we all know, as, as we start um, adding the effects of static pressure and increasing the back pressure on a PSC motor, and as we increase our RPMs, we're going to significantly lose the amount of capable um, torque off from that motor in general, which is why we're starting to go away from those permanent split capacitor uh, motors. But we still have them to work on, and they're going to be around for a while. So we just have to understand um, the the... Uh, effect of that capacitor and the quality of that capacitor. You know, if we look at the the differences between ECM motors and PSC motors, we can simply track the static pressure effects on them and see how much additional um, force is being exerted on that capacitor based on how much static pressure. You know, a lot of the problems we have in our field with the failures of capacitors are based on permanent split capacitor motors being used in uh, applications that ha have high external static pressure. Because as we increase that load on that motor, we're increasing the um, you know the, the resistance across that capacitor, and we're increasing the amount of electrons and and flow on that. Uh, so we're increasing um, heat on that capacitor. Um, uh, and that was just one of the charts. I'm pulling some of these um, slides off from our original uh, motor and capacitor presentation. So that's what it looks like inside of a permanent split capacitor motor. We have two one two windings. We have a run winding, and then we have our start winding, which is assisting that run winding. As we move into our ECM motors, we don't have to worry about that. We're actually using a true three-phase motor. So when we're looking at our capacitors, um, you know, one thing that we uh, we can identify on those, if we don't have a lot of information on our capacitor, we always know that our common terminal is going to have is typically going to have four tines on it. Our um, our Herm terminal, which are our compressor terminal, is going to have three tines, and our actual fan side, our condenser fan motor, is going to have two tines on it. And, and you know, we're all aware that a weak capacitor will affect the starting of a motor because it's not um, allowing potential energy to that start winding. And you know, we're simply going to be able to test our capacitors from common to Herm, and we also want to test those from common to fan and our capacitor is going to tell us what our potential tolerance is for that particular capacitor. You know, if we looked at this particular capacitor and I had a 40 plus five, uh, um, a four, yeah, 40 plus five, and I was at rated at 440 volts, but plus or minus 5%, um, if I am out of that 5% plus or minus from either one of those ratings, then that capacitor is going to be uh, replaced. That is um, extended out of its tolerance range. Now, um, one question that I, I brought up uh, this last summer when we were talking about capacitors, I'm going to go ahead and launch a quick poll real quick. If we have a capacitor, can you test a capacitor while it is in operation? So we all know that we can test a capacitor once we've disconnected voltage to it, but can we test that capacitor while that thing is running? So one of the things I learned in the field, so out of this poll, so 57% of the people online have voted, 50% uh, say yes, 25% say no, and 25% say that they have never heard of such a thing. So one <laughs> of the things, that we, yeah, that's why we do this. So it's always fun to um, to see what people know in the field and to get an idea of you know what we have learned in the field and what things that we have found in the field. So one of the things that I had, had found out in the field to, to do a capacitance load test, so an actual testing of the capacitance rating of a capacitor while it was running is simply this. So the actual formula for that is going to, the microfarads are going to equal the amps times 2652, which is a factor of your cycling rate of your voltage, um, divided by the actual capacitor rating voltage. So what we did in the field as part of our service is actual reading that microfarad rating on that capacitor while it's under load, because we can have a different rating of that capacitor while it is dis, um, disengaged from the circuit with nothing flowing through it and it's been you know, de-energized versus what it is under load. So if we measure the amps off, so if we're looking at the compressor side of it and we're looking at the microfarad rating of that capacitor on the Herm terminal, if we measure the amps on the Herm terminal, 
And then we measure the voltage from common to Herm. That's giving our calculated voltage across. And it is going to be higher than our rated voltage. So that's going to be the collected electron voltage on those terminals. And then we plug those two numbers into that simple formula. So say we had three amps running to that compressor on that Herm terminal. And our actual rated voltage that we measured from common to Herm was 330. So we were discharging 330 volts across those two terminals. And we plug those numbers in. So if we took our three amps times 2652, and that is not a set number if we're working in uh, places outside of the United States that work on 50 hertz per, uh, 50 cycles, um, 50 hertz per second um, voltage, then there's a different calculated number for that. But here in the United States, um, it calculates out to about 2652. So we take our three amps times 2652 and we divide that by that functional voltage across that capacitor. So in our case, it was uh, 330. So that would leave us uh, three times 2652 is 7956. And we divide that 7956 by our 330 voltage. And that calculates out to about 24.11 on this particular capacitor. So this you know, would have been a probably a 25 plus 5 capacitor. So we actually can run that. Now, the thing we always have to discuss when we're talking about any type of live circuitry, you know, PPE is going to be completely in play here because we're talking about a live circuit that has high potential voltage. We're not talking about 240 volts. We're talking about 330 plus. We're talking about 440. You know, if a capacitor is rated up to 440 volts, it's rated to operate up into that voltage range. So we can have very, very high potential voltage across that capacitor. But we did this a lot in the field when we were verifying the um, the capability of a capacitor when it was under load. So you know this is an operating system with high current and high voltage at the same time. But we can calculate out the functional capacity of that um, capacitor under load. Um, you know we've all seen capacitors in the field that have um, been subjected to high current and high heat. Um, typically, pretty pretty physically um, destroyed once they get to that point and it's all because they've been overworked. Um, you know, what we had done, we, um, we were really curious of, of the inner workings of capacitor, so um, we went ahead and uh, cut open our capacitor to see what we had inside. Now, this one video, um, my video, is in, my internet speed's not processing very well, um, so I'm gonna have to skip through a little bit on this next slide. Uh, we were just curious what it looked like on the inside. Um, so we went ahead and just um, grabbed a can opener and slice this bad boy open so we can look at the inner functions of that capacitor so this was our uh, this is one that came back to me under warranty and um, when we open that thing up because as technicians we really um, we, we've never really talked about what is inside of a capacitor how is it constructed you know uh, as a technician you know most of us are technicians that have worked on a variety of different pieces of equipment in our lifetime whether it's automotive or you know we all enjoy technicians enjoy working on stuff and fixing things and so uh, one of the, the 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 beauties of understanding the construction of something is knowing how it how it's affected and you know how it is built and what fails inside of a capacitor so this was our um, this was part of our um, questionnaire that we did when we did this class this summer so we're looking at that 40 I think as a or 50 plus 5 capacitor we know that it is constructed out of foil and we know that it is in an, a uh, an insulating liquid how many feet of foil are inside that typical dual run capacitor? So let's just talk about this particular one we had here, OEM capacitor. You know, um, microfarads are determined by surface area of your film. So uh, Cliff, you know, the more microfarads, the more surface area of film which you have. So as you go up, like a 50 and a five, it's going to have a lot of film in it, running feet of film. Yeah. And and that was it really, it, it blew our mind as technicians as we started talking about this. And this is why I so much appreciate you joining us, Ron, because we didn't have this information. So what I had did when I did this class earlier in the summer is I actually contacted a couple of our OEM distributors. It took a long time to get back to engineers, but I got there. So here's what I got off from my poll. My poll is showing that about 57% of the people that is joining us today is voted. 25% say about 100 feet. 
50% say about 1,000 feet, and 25% say about 2,000 feet. Um, so a little bit of a range on what that is. So it does, it's going to depend on the actual capacitor that we're working with. So on this particular one, what we found you know, looking at that capacitor, there's a, there's a lot of winding on that. That's what the end of our roll looked like on this OEM capacitor, and there's a contact points for it. That's so where you common. Your bottom is where your commons hooked up. Your yeah, and I did, I'd been in the field for 21 years, and I'd never cut open a capacitor to see what was inside, and that's what we do with these classes. We, uh, we cut stuff open, and we look at things so that we can understand how something is constructed so that we can better understand how to diagnose that thing and what has failed when, on it. When you we go look to at, the... Sorry, when you go to the no. top end there and you see yeah. it melted, yeah. that's, it, it couldn't handle the volts running through there. It failed because of the heat created by the voltage running in that, voltage running around and around and around in that one part, melted yeah. internally. Your hardest, your hottest part is the center of that core. I and bet. That's why you see it come up there. Yeah. yeah, as soon as we cut that open, we're like, that's what failed. And, and for a 440 volt, it should be made from a lot thicker film than a 370 volt. So in this case, uh, it might have been on the low side of the voltage, uh, of the film for that voltage. Right. And that's kind of what I wanted to get to today is talking about our universal capacitors. We'll talk about some of the capacitors that we stock here at Johnstone, and we want to talk about some of the capacitors that we do not stock. Because when we when we get into that, when we cut that capacitor open, it helped me understand the construction. Just think about that. On that particular capacitor, that manufacturer said that they had about a thousand feet of film in that can. So I think about that as a quality perspective. That is a lot of quality control to maintain a consistent thickness across that foil. Because remember, that thin of a foil, anytime that we change the surface tension on that, or we overheat it, or we have a pore that wasn't consistent, it's going to change the way that we flow current through that particular portion, right? So if we think about a capacitor, and we think about the different manufacturers of capacitors out there, it, it all comes back to quality and construction. You know, if we want to compare a products to, um, let's just take for instance, if you're into handguns, I love handguns. I love shooting. If we take a uh, if we take a 1911 service pistol, I can take a mil spec 1911 that costs five hundred dollars, and I can take a mil spec 1911 that costs five thousand dollars. And by design, they are constructed the same. They are built the same. They meet certain specifications. But is that five hundred dollar 1911 the same as that five thousand dollar 1911? Absolutely not. The difference is in the quality of controls in the material that is being manufactured from and the quality of the manufacturing itself and the inspections that come because of that. So we have to think about that when we go into looking at capacitors, because by the time we get into capacitors, now we're starting to talk about aftermarket replacements, right? So what is the quality capacitors? Because as a service department, as a service technician, we don't want those callbacks. You know, we have a very low margin of profits on doing a service anyhow, especially on a capacitor. We're not going to, I mean, we might make some GP on the capacitor itself, but our labor rate is not going to be significantly high. What happens if this capacitor fails in, in the, the first six months, you know, while we've given that one year warranty on our particular product? Now we're losing our butts on GP. So we want to talk about construction. And, you know, you guys know that as a technician, we're here to just talk about the things that we see in the field, the things that work and the things that don't. You know, as we've been talking about these universal gas valves and, and universal control boards over the last few weeks, it's all about talking about the products that work and the ones that don't. I am a huge fan of the turbo products and we stock those here at Johnstone Supply and we're going to talk about those. And that's why I'm, I'm really excited that Ron, uh, if you guys haven't noticed that uh, Ron Elkin is with Amrad, who's the manufacturer of the turbo products. And uh, we're grateful that he is here today. Um, I'm going to launch one more poll real quick. And this one will be, uh, most of you probably know this one is a, uh, the, the castor oil that we use in that. Is it an isolator? Or is it a conductor? So we launched this poll this last summer talking to guys to um, to try to decipher. And looks like most of the guys here probably went through that class. 100% of them are saying that it is an insulator. And that's what we're using it for. We're using it as an insulator for 
our electrons that are flowing through that. When I was talking about that uh, 50 plus 5 capacitor, that one had um, uh, about 1,000 feet of or 3 ounces of aluminum foil inside of that. That is a self-healing style. Now, if we get into our universal capacitors and what we stock here at our Johnstone Supply, and um, Craig, I know you are still out there. Do you guys stock the uh, the turbo um, product line at your Johnstone branches? Yeah, we stock the multis and okay. all the sizes. Yeah, absolutely. And you know that is that's my product of of preference. And so we're going to talk about the ones that we stock here. So here at my particular Johnstones, we carry the 200, we carry the two, uh, 200x, and we carry the 200 mini. Now, if we um, if we look at what comes in those products, this is our Turbo 200. So it is a uh, it's a multi replacement capacitor that has a combined um, total microfarad rating of 67.5 through its total taps. So we can tap on a a 2.5 point, a five, a, a two fives actually, a 10, a 20, and a 25. Now, depending on um, what tap you use will give you your actual rating for that one. So if we look at here on this installation manual, I can actually zoom in on that a little bit so we can get a little bit closer to it. If, uh, if you're a guy in the field and you've got a 25 plus 5, excuse me, um, if you got a 25 plus 5, we're going to grab the 25 jumper and we're going to grab our 5 jumper. And we've got, you know, either one of those that we can work with. But if we were on a, let's say, a 50 plus 7.5, we can use that same exact capacitor. Now we're going to use these um, supplied jumpers, these little yellow jumper wires, and we're going to add our 25, our 20, and our 5 to give us 50. So that's now going to be the... Um, the the Herm side, so we'll have from common to Herm, and that gives us our 50 microfarad to feed our Herm side, and then we're going to have a 7.5 to feed our condenser fan motor, so we simply run a jumper wire from our 5 to our 2.5, and now we have a 7.5 microfarad rating that we're going to run over to our fan wire. So, you know, uh, lots of combinations that we can use on that particular capacitor. Let me uh, zoom back out so I can get to the next slide. Um, that is the inside of the boxing for it. And the one item that I'm very excited about that Turbo is releasing that we don't actually carry at our Johnstone yet, but I'm sure we are going to in the very near future, is they have now released a uh, Turbo Easy Start. So it's going to be a, um, a multi-purpose hard start kit that is usable between one and five tons. So if you look at the, um, the hard starts that we carry now, they're dependent on on capacity, on on the tonnage of the pieces of equipment that you're working on. So the turbo that they have now is going to function between one and five tons, um, and depending on jumper placement, just like the Turbo 200 and the Turbo 200 Xs. So you have um, multi horsepower ratings depending on the taps that we'll actually be using for that thing. One one, one comment on that. Oh yeah, please uh, do. Uh, yeah, uh, the jumper wires. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, can you see? Can you view me? Um, I don't. The, have, I don't have your camera being showed just yet. Uh, all right. Some... Anyway, it, it'll come with certain uh, selection of jumper wires. There'll be three jumper wires, and they're color coded, color identified. Uh, so if you have a, a three ton system, it automatically tells you it's going to be red, yellow, and purple. Uh -huh. So you match the red, yellow, purple terminals on the can itself with the red, yellow, purple jumper wire. One jumper gotcha. wire pushes it all on, has a common and has the Herm already identified black and white wires. Yep. And the bottom is magnetic. And it, it's, it's installed just as quickly as I told you for a weak compressor, something struggling to come on, or yeah. for something locked up. I've seen it unlock 94, 95, and 105 amps. Obviously, for a three ton system, it went to a five ton setup, but it keeps it running till the contractor can come back with a solution. So your customer has cold air and it's a good system, five year warranty. No one has a five year warranty. And what, it, what you didn't realize, and I should have pointed out, the relay is internal. So you do not have to connect or wire in a relay. You don't have to mount a relay or anything like that. So it's very fast. Yeah. So that's got a relay built into the top of the can then? Yep. Yep. Nice. Yeah. Very, very interesting little product. Very excited to see that one. Yeah, and it's basically the same size as any of the others, except for the small, I think, SPP uh, one type stuff. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I love the fact that it's got that magnetic base on it. That'd be really interesting to see. We we put it on the front of a BMW and took it down the road at 50 miles an hour and it stayed there. <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of stuff we like to talk about here on Flex Train. <laughs> we, wondered you had, how strong, we wondered how strong it was and now we know. Yeah, I would too. Absolutely. Now, um, Ron, is there any um, any mention or any thoughts of adding that magnetic base to any of the other turbo products? It, you well, you can't because some of the areas where capacitors are mounted, it'll affect the relays. Oh, some of the capacitors okay. and systems are mounted very close to relays, and we right. found that um, that magnetic base magnetic would, resistance. Yeah, that I makes mean, sense. Yeah, we we actually uh, do a lot of testing in one of the offices. One of the uh, one of the engineering managers, he has uh, air conditioners hooked up three ton systems in his office, and so we do crazy stuff in his office. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and so one of the things, you know, as a uh, as a distributor, I wanted to talk about some of the other products that we have out on the market, um, just to be fair to everybody else. And, uh, you know, because as a technician, you know, you're going to encounter homeowners that are going to do their, you know, internet searching, go, hey, I found this cool run capacitor out there and it's only $48 and 60 cents. And I can order that from home Depot. Is that the same thing that you have? No, <laughs> um, not at all. So, you know, when we talk about replacement parts, like any other thing, you're going to have knockoffs that come from other countries, these cool runs on this particular cool run. It's designed in the UK, but manufactured in the People's Republic of China. You know, it's going to have a lot of the similar ratings on its box. You know, it's going to show that it's got the 67.5 microfarad rating. It's capable 440 volts. It's got the same taps, blah, 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 blah. It, you're going to see the motor mate um, out there. And if you're looking at that motor mate and you're looking at that cool run, the only difference between the two of those is a sticker that's put on the outside of that. Uh, that's the same manufacturer. So I wanted to pull up some um, reviews of some of these products. So, you know, just being fair, just to be able to compare other products. So um, these are pulled right off from the Amazon responses to the products that they sell. There was um, there were zero ratings for the previous capacitor, which I thought was kind of interesting that they didn't even have any ratings for it. Um, but for the motor mate, they did actually have some ratings. They had a uh, most of them fell in the one out of five ratings, as you can see. Um, not an extremely reliable product. You know, when we talk about manufacturing, I'm, I'm, I'm a big proponent of buying U.S. made products because we have very diligent manufacturing, um, you know, expectations. And, you know, just like when we're talking about, you know, other products that are built the same, look the same, feel the same, function the same. It really comes down to uh, quality and, you know, product reliability. And if we talk about, you know, our Turbo 200 products, they, they just last. Other manufacturers that came around and built some, we sell Titan capacitors here. I have very little problem with Titan capacitors, but they got into the universal replacement market for a while as well. They came out with that Titan Flex. And um, as you can see, that product had already been discontinued as well. So when it comes to pr uh, product reliability, um, the Turbo 200 line of products has just, they've been a fantastic product to not only use, but to sell. And, you know, that's, that's something that I wanted us to cover is you know, reliability, because if we get down to talking about the service aspect of things and talking about the GP on, on our service department, it really is going to be affected by our callback ratio, right? That's the number one effect of our profit as a service department when it comes to component replacements is our callback ratio. So um, the Turbo 200s are manufactured by American Radionic Company. Um, their product line, I wanted to take you guys to their website so that we can look at product offerings and warranty registrations and a whole lot of information about the actual components. So, um, Ron, um, anything else you would like to say about your products? Because I, I can't preach about them enough. They are the only thing, they are the only capacitors that I carried on my service van. And um, I, I think it's um, a great opportunity to have a representative to actually talk about their product. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, 
Yeah, go back to, um, don't go back in your photos or anything, but a few years ago, I got this phone call. The switchboard passed it through to me, and she said, uh, you really need to take this phone call. So I took it, and this guy was cussing me with words I've never heard. And um, he was a, a distributor, wholesaler in the uh, Arlington, Virginia area. And he let me know he had three fires associated with my Turbo 200 product. Uh, and I said, that's all I need to know. Give me your address, phone number, location. I got on the plane right. uh, out of Daytona, flew up there. The next morning, I was knocking on his door, very tired person. And he immediately began to apologize. It was not ours. It was a knockoff. He had three fires, one on his home. Home. He just brought this product in, thought he was being good for his customers. And he had two customers reporting fires within the next two days. So right. he had taken it off his parts, uh, off his trucks and contacted everyone to take it back. Going back to what you said, a good quality product is very important. Uh, everything you see is made in Palm Coast, Florida, just north of Daytona. And they, it, uh, they only use the, the top quality of film. The film is most significant. That's where your heat comes. It, Absolutely. A, a 330 has, you know, you could hold them. Let's take, let's take uh, three capacitors, same microfarad. Let's use 50 microfarad, for example. 370, a 440, and a 600 volt. We make 600 volt product. Mm. And run them for one hour or run them for 24 hours. You can hold that 370 can in your hand, that capacitor can. As it's running, you can hold it in your hand. The 440 would be very hot. You would probably have a blister if you held it very, very long, even seconds. But a 600 volt capacitor is just like super hot. So you must make the film for the application. So a 440 volt application is the way to go for uh, most of the HVAC industry because a lot of people shortcut the 370. So that's why you see a lot of contractors only buying a 440 volt part in for a 370 application which right. it works down and don't work up. Um, yeah, the, the turbo was created for the contractor, for the service guy, for the industry. In areas like Atlanta, Houston, Texas, Washington, D.C., uh, any area where it takes twice as long as a rural area to go on the road, most contractors carry turbo products. I mean, cases at a time. There's a guy in Texas that buys them by a pallet load at a time because, of, you know, we sell through distributors like you guys. Right. And the reason being is he's always got the right part on his truck. Absolutely. Always have the right part on his truck. And it's a reliable part. And you know, guys don't think about it, but how many times does your service guys go back to buy a part from you guys? You know, <laughs> two or three times a week, particularly in the summer when it's really hot and they get hit with a lot of, you know, a lot of four or five ton systems out there are using 80 mics. Or 80s and fives, or even oh, 55s yeah. and fives, or 50s and fives, and so you use up a lot on your truck. Well, if he doesn't have it on his truck, he's got to go to a wholesaler. Hopefully, it's you guys, and then he's got to go back to the site. Maybe losing an hour, an hour and a half. So if the service companies knew their cost to operate their truck, they would all make a decision. I think to carry turbos on every truck. The minis, there's a mini oval, by the way, that goes into like the Ream products. I have seen that, yes. Yeah, it's a mini oval, and uh, it's it, it's a great seller uh, out of here. And uh, anyway, uh, if you got those, you can service anything. Uh, you know, I, I was down in Fort Myers, and a contractor came in looking for a 40 and a 7 and a half. Wow. It was a Linux. It was a Linux deal. That's an odd one. Yeah. He said he he said he'd been to two locations and didn't have anything. And the guys searched his stuff and said, "I don't have one either." And I said, "Guys, there's a turbo <laughs> sitting right over there on the shelf, about eight of them." And the wow. guy looked at me. He hit himself in the forehead. And he said, "I've got two in my truck." <laughs> Prime example. And out the door he went because they yeah. don't think. You know, they they yeah. they they really don't think, and that's not something. Uh, I guess it happens to you one time. And you, you remember going forward. Yeah. No, we're that's we're building a uh, a service manager workshop, a two day workshop. And, you know, that's one of the things we're discussing is, you know, GP and net profits on on service side, because when we first started carrying the Turbo 200 products, I mean, we're talking. I don't remember when I first started carrying them it had to be, you know, 15, 18 years ago or so, whenever, you know, they, they first hit the market. Um, About we, 16 we, years ago. 
that'd be about when I carried them then. So we were, mm -hmm. as soon as they started uh, releasing them, we had them on our service vans. But the thing that we initially looked at was the cost of the turbo was so much more than a standard run capacitor. We, our first um, reaction was to, um, if we didn't have the capacitor on the van, we installed the turbo and then we went and got the OEM capacitor and we came back, we put it on, we kept that turbo on basically as a rescue for ourselves until we started looking at the GP on the return, on those return call ratios. And we were losing our butt on doing those returns for those OEM capacitors that probably didn't meet the same specifications as the turbo. Yeah, so yeah. we quickly decided to change our practice. And when we started using those turbos um, as a first time replacement, um, it, it was it was a no brainer. Um, yeah, there was a little bit more initial cost on it. But when we explained to the homeowner, hey, um, yeah, I can go get a $30 capacitor for you, um, but it's going to be an extra hour of labor. <laughs> so. right. And you go to the next site. Uh, the contractor gets to go to the next site. It's exactly, you're exactly right. The national average is about $125 an hour, to, hour. To, to operate or own a service truck. And Correct. if you have to go for an hour either way to pick up something in, uh, in the uh, D.C. area, 30 miles would take you a, over an hour. Yeah, I'm in, sure. Uh, from, from, from early morning till after afternoon. And uh, so if you've got to go out and back, find something, you know, you're going to easily waste an hour. Most guys don't pay that much. And, if, and in Florida, they sell them for about 125 bucks to the homeowner. Yes. The exes go for about, down in Fort Myers, I was talking to some contractors and they're selling it for like 185 bucks well they're only paying right. like maybe 62 or 63 bucks for it from you guys so yeah it's, they they are in and out quickly mm -hmm. uh, the, anytime the capacitor has that domed effect that you saw where it, it, the, the, uh, the top of the can actually uh, goes up uh, it's, it's a doming effect that is from the melting gas inside of that and uh, there's an interrupter in there that interrupts the power coming in. So that's why it does not blow up. If it blows up, like the one example which you have, it was not made properly. Correct. Uh, I, would, I would probably question going forward anything that comes from that, that it wasn't made properly. But that had a lot. And uh, that actually could cause a, car, a carbon fire. Uh, University of Florida has uh, done some research for us, and we actually have uh, over 4,000 inrush of volts to blow a can like that up. Wow. Before your before your panel can uh, cut it off, mm -hmm. uh, that's how much current would draw to do something like that. So wow. yeah, but you want something that's put together and tested often, uh, which the turbo product is. And any of your customers can come through the factory anytime. Yeah. So uh, yeah, well, we might have to arrange that. <laughs> if you're going, if <laughs> you're going to Daytona, if you're going to Daytona for a car race or Daytona to the beach, yeah. we're like 22 miles north. Really? Yeah. I think I'll have to make a point myself. Yep. Well, guys, that is uh, capacitors and universal capacitors. And, um, you know, it's just a good opportunity for us as an industry to just sit down and talk about what we have and, you know, try to improve the relationship of our contractors with us and with their customers. And high quality components are the key to running a proper service department. And uh, in my book, there's uh, there's no better capacitors than the the turbo line. So everyone, have a uh, a fantastic and safe day for those of you that are that are dealing with ice. And uh, look forward to seeing you again next week on Flex Train. If anybody uh, wants to see what the topics are for each week, you can go to JohnstoneSolutions.com website, and under our training tab, it has a a, a listing. Actually, if you want to? I see you looking right there. I'll show you guys where that's at. So this is our uh, training function of our website. Let me just reduce that. So if you go to... Nice photograph. Yeah. If I get my internet running fast enough. There's our Johnstone Solutions. So that is the website for our Grimmy group. And if you scroll to train... Oop, I went too fast. That's next week's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if we scroll over here to training, it'll have a listing of all of our available courses on our calendar. And every Thursday is our flex train classes.
And so if I look right there, here is, so each week has got our topics that we're going to be covering and it has a uh, registration. Um, if you want to, if there's someone interested in joining a flex train, they can register from any of these. When you register for one flex train, you register for the entire series for the whole year. I uh, also do one every other Friday that is Daikin specific and then uh, has listing some of our other classes as well. And we also have a, um, a website or a, a YouTube channel. It's Johnstone Solutions University. So we are a para accredited university. And those are um, starting to get rebuilt. Uh, got about 70 videos out there. A lot of them come from our flex train classes. And um, I had to do a bunch of re-editing on um, a big portion of those, add some legal disclosures. So um, welcome, everybody. And uh, thank you for joining us. And we will see you all next week on Flex Train. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Cliff. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Cliff.